This video is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. During World War II, no army had a greater appreciation for the submachine gun than the Soviet Red Army. While other nations primarily issued submachine guns to special forces, paratroopers, vehicle crews, unit weapon reserves, and in an unofficial capacity, the Soviets stood up entire platoon, company, and battalion-sized units composed entirely of submachine guns with a specific purpose. While other armies sometimes issued submachine guns to personnel not specifically authorized them, it speaks to a whole nother level of institutional respect for a platform when somebody organizes entire battalions in regular maneuver units around its use. This video is going to cover the conditions that caused the Soviets to flock to this doctrine, as well as the organization of dedicated submachine gun units and the tactics they used. The Soviet application for the submachine gun was initially the result of its experience fighting the Finns during the Winter War. The Finns used light automatic weapons, most notably submachine guns, to gain fire superiority over isolated Soviet units through hit-and-run raids, encirclement, and the element of surprise. As of 1939, there were no submachine guns in the Soviet infantry division. This would change after the Winter War, but would not really pick up until after the German invasion of the Soviet Union had begun. The tool of the Soviet submachine gun doctrine was the PPSH-41, supplemented by the later and further simplified PPS-43. Chambered in the small, relatively high-velocity 7.62 Tokarev cartridge, the PPSH-41 had marginally superior effective range when compared to many of its contemporaries, even if it could be considered underpowered. Still, it was more controllable with its higher rate of fire than it would have been with a heavier cartridge. This actually contributed to some gun myths in the Soviet military, similar to those in the US, where there was a marked dislike for the American Thompson submachine gun rationalized by it having such a large, low-velocity round. Although the PPD would have been the submachine gun in service at the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, low production numbers meant that it was not really available to most units. The PPSH solved a key problem, that being the cost and time to manufacture. By the time PPSH manufacture had matured in 1943, they were costing only 142 rubles per unit. This was marginally cheaper than a Mosin Nagant rifle, 6 times cheaper than a PPD submachine gun, and 8 times cheaper than a DP light machine gun. Further, the PPSH only took 5.6 hours to manufacture versus the 13.7 hours of the PPD. This manufacture time would be halved again when the PPS-43 was introduced. So in addition to solving the problem of getting light, mass-produced automatic firepower in the hands of frontline soldiers, they were also as cheap if not cheaper than a regular service rifle, and far cheaper than a semi-automatic SVT or DP light machine gun. Now we're going to look at the main types of submachine gun units that the Red Army fielded. This won't be exhaustive as the Soviets employed submachine gunners in all manner of units. Self-propelled assault gun regiments received their own submachine gun company as infantry support, for example. But for this video, we will be focusing on the application of subguns in infantry regiments and tank brigades specifically. At the lowest levels, Soviet rifle platoons used submachine guns similarly to other powers by the late war, but in larger numbers. As of shortly before Operation Barbarossa, the commander of a rifle platoon and two riflemen per rifle squad would ideally have been armed with a PPD submachine gun. However, because of low production numbers, the vast majority of units would have likely been using rifles in this role. By July of 1941, after the start of Barbarossa, a more realistic role was cut out for the submachine gun, partially replacing light machine guns. The submachine gun armed riflemen and platoon commander submachine gun were deleted, and two squads per platoon would have their light machine gun replaced with a submachine gun likely due to shortages. By December of 1941, each rifle platoon would be authorized three submachine guns to be given to a rifleman or squad commander, most likely in three out of four squads. This would be increased to four submachine guns per platoon in July of 1942, but things would really start to pick up in mid-1943 to early 1944. At this time, the platoon commander got their submachine gun back, while each squad got two submachine guns going to the squad commander and a dedicated submachine gunner or possibly the assistant machine gunner. This would enhance junior leaders and designate submachine gunners' ability to suppress the enemy in the terminal phase of an attack. However, unlike in the early war, by this point in the war they would have actually been producing enough submachine guns to actually make this a reality or exceed it. Platoon sizes would be decreased in December of 1944, but submachine gun allotments remain the same. 
During the same period in mid-1943, one of the rifle company's three rifle platoons was converted into a submachine gun platoon. The 1943 and 44 submachine gun platoon consisted of a platoon headquarters, two light squads, and two heavy squads. In the platoon HQ was the platoon commander, a lieutenant with a pistol and a submachine gun, the deputy platoon commander, a senior sergeant with a submachine gun, and two snipers, Euphraters, armed with sniper rifles. Light squads were led by a sergeant squad commander armed with a submachine gun and further consisted of one machine gunner with a DP light machine gun, one assistant machine gunner armed with a submachine gun, and six submachine gunners all armed with submachine guns. One of these was a junior sergeant and acted as the assistant squad commander analogous to the modern day senior rifleman. The heavy squads were essentially light squads, except replacing two of the riflemen with an additional DP light machine gun team. While in a perfect world, the platoon would have gotten all of these machine guns, it is likely that in many cases, three light squads was more realistic. The platoon organization was amended in December of 1944, in line with a general reduction in bodies but increase in firepower within Soviet infantry units. The platoon squads were simplified into four homogeneous squads, with a sergeant squad commander, junior sergeant deputy squad commander, a DP machine gunner, an assistant machine gunner, and three submachine gunners. One submachine gunner was to be taken from the squads to act as a platoon messenger in the platoon HQ. At all times, this organization was essentially the same as the regular rifle platoon, except without the riflemen replacing the rifles with submachine guns. SMG platoons provided each company with a shock assault capability. They would spearhead attacks against weakly defended portions of the enemy line and carry out stealthy attacks behind enemy lines, destroying targets in the enemy's rear areas such as vehicles, outposts, communication centers, machine gun positions, and artillery batteries. This was intended to achieve a demoralization effect and disrupt the enemy's movement and communication in support of company operations. During conventional attacks, the submachine gun platoon could be employed either on the flanks of the company, in interval between rifle platoons, split up and attached to rifle platoons, or as the basis of an assault group. They could also be used to deceive the enemy by feigning an attack in a different direction from the rest of the company, drawing enemy fire. Meanwhile, in the defense, the company's submachine gun platoon would typically act as the second echelon during the day, while rifle platoons were up at the front. They would be used to defend the company's depth or flanks in concealed positions against enemy infiltrators, using their automatic firepower and surprise to set up ambushes. Meanwhile, at night, the submachine gun platoon would be brought up to the front to take advantage of the limited visibility and low engagement distances. Similar to the submachine gun platoon in function, but at a higher level and with more independence, was the Regimental Submachine Gun Company. In October of 1941, Stalin ordered that each rifle regiment be furnished with an entire submachine gun company to act as a close combat shock unit. Later, the more distinguished guards rifle regiments were authorized two submachine gun companies as of mid to late 1942. The submachine gun companies were to be employed by the regimental commanders either as a company or individual platoons with separate tasks. As of the early and mid-war, each company consisted of a small company headquarters and three submachine gun platoons with about 100 submachine guns for the lot. These formations allowed the regimental commanders to concentrate mass amounts of mobile, automatic firepower in a way they couldn't with DP light machine guns, but at the cost of medium and long range firepower. In the offense, their primary job was to support the main attack of the regiment or form the regimental reserve. They accomplished this by attacking the enemy flank or rear simultaneous with the main attack and conducting rapid attacks behind enemy lines following covert infiltrations. If a regimental attack had failed, the regiment commander could have deployed a reserve submachine gun company to outmaneuver the enemy and infiltrate their lines. Infiltration of weak points in the enemy line could be done on foot, by truck, or on skis during the winter time. Once attacks were carried out, submachine gun companies were to continue maneuvering to attack new targets rather than halting behind enemy lines. A covert approach in the element of surprise was critical because submachine gunners were only effective at ranges of at most 2 to 300 meters. With limited medium and long range firepower, actual breakthroughs on the enemy front would be conducted by the rifle companies, and if submachine guns participated, it would be in support of conventional units. In the defense, similar to the submachine gun platoon, the submachine gun company acted as a regimental reserve, repelling enemy penetrations in depth and counterattacking. Meanwhile, on the march, the submachine gun company typically traveled partially as the regiment's forward detachment or in reserve. 
As such, they could be tasked with being a vanguard for regimental or battalion attacks into the enemy's depth. They could also be used for reconnaissance or to screen the flanks of the main body to provide early warning and mitigate enemy ambushes. This was especially important in low visibility conditions, such as at night, in acclimate weather, or in heavily wooded areas. Meanwhile, Soviet motorized rifle battalions received a submachine gun platoon. These battalions were integral to mechanized brigades, which operated in conjunction with tank brigades at the core level. Earlier in late 1941 and early 1942, both mechanized brigades and tank brigades received one submachine gun company. In tank brigades, this company was part of the Motor Rifle Battalion, which also had two rifle companies, a mortar company and various command and supporting subunits. At this point, these brigade level submachine gun companies were entirely submachine gun armed because they were intended to act as tank riders. But in November of 1943, the Tank Brigade Submachine Gun Company was upgraded to an entire motor submachine gun battalion, with submachine gun companies replacing the conventional rifle companies. This new type of battalion consisted of one battalion HQ, two submachine gun companies, one descent or tank rider company, one anti-tank rifle company, one 57mm or 76mm anti-tank gun battery, one 82mm mortar company, one service platoon, and one medical detachment. The submachine gun companies were armed similarly to a rifle company, with a machine gun platoon serving two Maxim or SG-43 machine guns, three submachine gun platoons per company with three DP light machine guns per SMG platoon. These two companies were transported in one and a half ton trucks furnished by the service platoon, although they could also be employed as tank riders. The main difference between a tank brigade, SMG company, and a rifle company was that every man that was typically armed with a rifle in a rifle company would be armed with a submachine gun. Similarly, in an anti-tank rifle company, everyone was armed with a submachine gun except for the anti-tank riflemen. Additionally, submachine gunners in tank brigade and mechanized brigade SMG companies typically ranked Euphrater or higher rather than private. This is similar to how tankers in Soviet doctrine were at lowest junior sergeants and tank commanders were meant to be lieutenants. This may have been to raise morale, but also could have been a comment on the skill and experience needed to conduct the submachine gunner mission. The Dassault Company was different from the two submachine gun companies. Unlike the submachine gun companies, the Dassault Company was armed exclusively with submachine guns, with no other medium or light machine guns. It consisted of a company HQ and three submachine gun platoons, with a platoon HQ and three submachine gun squads per platoon. They rode tanks into battle, providing close infantry support and defending the tanks from anti-tank infantry. The Dassault Company could be split into its subordinate platoons depending on the mission, for example, two platoons of tank riders could be employed as part of a forward detachment that consisted of a tank company, the tank riders, and supporting fires, while the other platoon remained in reserve. When acting as a landing party, tank riders would come under the command of the tank unit commander. Each squad would ride on one tank with a squad commander placed in the center behind the tank turret to allow him to control the entirety of his squad and receive orders from the tank commander. Close cooperation between tanks and tank riders was critical, as it would be easy for tankers to get into a situation that would be too dangerous for tank riders, order a dismount in a non-optimal position, or leave the tank riders behind, which would leave both elements without support. Similarly to submachine gunners and infantry regiments, following a breakthrough created by the tanks and infantry, tank riders would attack the enemy in its depth, targeting similar objectives. The limitations of the submachine gunners here were similar in the infantry, being supporting units that fulfilled a specific role except with the added responsibility of protecting tanks. So in summary, submachine guns provided maneuver units at all levels with effective close combat capability with dedicated subgun units intended for specific purposes. They generally had to use stealth and surprise to their advantage so they could close within effective range of the enemy. They were not meant to be used for major breakthroughs except when directly supporting a tank or infantry offensive. Rather, they were meant to infiltrate enemy lines through weak points of the front. They excelled at covertly attacking enemy flanks and rear areas, and they could be used for reconnaissance or to screen the flanks of the main unit. In tank units, they were vital in protecting tanks from enemy infantry. And lastly, in urban environments, the submachine gunners excelled due to the environment's limited engagement distances. They were limited, however, by the fact that they generally did not have great medium or long-range firepower. Some generals critiqued the use of submachine gun units post-war, with one recommending that light machine guns be retained and submachine guns be used at a 1 to 1 ratio with carbines. 
Ultimately, the true solution to these limitations would end up being the Kalashnikov AK rifle adopted in 1949, bridging the gap between service rifles and submachine guns. And now a quick shout out to our patrons, especially our new producer. If you want to support us even when we get demonetized and get exclusive benefits like early access to scripts, a role on our Discord, and exclusive wallpapers, consider becoming a patron. Link is in the description. Thank you everybody, and I'll see you all in the next one.